Marx says that the crisis is imminent in capitalism. So he says uh, that the movement of capitalist society is full of contradictions and how these contradictions express themselves uh, is through the economic crisis. And of course, we had a big crisis in 2008 yeah, uh, that is still ongoing and turned into a political crisis uh, also. Uh, I think we can also take from Marx the idea that there's a dialectic of technology and society. Uh, so uh, in uh, Capital Volume 1, uh, on the, uh, the chapter on machinery and large-scale industry, uh, he talks about the contradictions of machinery in capitalism. Yeah? And I think we can visualize uh, it a bit like this. Yeah? So that there is technology and features that it has as such and consequences, and then there's technology uh, in capitalism. And these are all sorts of contradictions that we uh, have here. So technology as such and also e automation can ease work. Yeah? Uh, it, mean, uh, it brings forward the idea of a society without toil. However, within capitalist class relations, when it's embedded, it also results in an intensification of uh, labor, yeah? in, in overall in an inversion uh, of means uh, and ends so that, uh, that uh, technology becomes a kind of subject that objectifies and reifies uh, human beings. Yeah? And then also historically and con uh, contemporary, uh, the use of machines also brings forth uh, social struggles uh, about uh, te uh, technolo uh, te technologies. Yeah? I think that's something we can learn from Marx. Then in the Grundrisse, there's this uh, idea of the general intellect, the kind of general social knowledge. Yeah? Uh, so it's the, somehow the idea that uh, he anticipated the idea of information economy. Yeah? So Marx argues that uh, capitalism requires constant increases of productivity. How do you increase productivity? By producing ever more uh, newer machines yeah? that have certain consequences uh, on uh, society. So, so technological progress uh, calls forth uh, also the increasing uh, importance of science and technology in society. At some point of stage, quantity turns into a new quality uh, and an informational economy or informational capitalism uh, has uh, emerged. Believe it or not, Marx is also relevant because he is the inventor of the internet. Yeah? In the Grundrisse, he speaks, that's a quote, yeah? he speaks or, or he envisions yeah? institutions emerging whereby each individual can acquire information about the activity of all others and uh, can establish interconnections uh, with others uh, through the mails, telegraphs, uh, and other uh, technologies. Yeah? So I think it was very visionary, yeah? imagining a global information system for informing, communicating, and networking. And I think that's what the internet today uh, is all uh, about. He talks about an antagonism between productive forces and relations of uh, production, so that the technological development, uh, on the one hand, uh, results in new forms of cooperation that, while uh, being Im uh, embedded in capitalism, uh, also uh, call forth new contradictions uh, and class uh, relations. Uh, shift this. Also, there's an, there are elements of a theory of communication and language uh, in uh, Marx. Yeah? Uh, so about the idea of, I mean, the, the one thing from a general sociological point of view that you can learn from Marx is that everything that exists in the human world is a social relation. Yeah? However, how do we organize, produce social relations, the process of creating, producing social relations, that's the communication process. Yeah? And language uh, is the medium of this communication uh, process. And what I'm interested in currently is to recover undiscovered or forgotten approaches in the history of Marxist theory uh, that help us to understand and theorize communication uh, in a uh, critical way. So for example, there's a book by Georg Lukacs, The Ontology of Social Being, and another one, The Aesthetic. Both of them have not been translated from German into English, uh, and there's lots of interesting things uh, in there. Marx also asks, helps us to ask questions about how different categories like economy, society, work, communication, capital and power, labor and ideology, how they are related uh, to each other. 
What I would say, and I take this idea from Raymond Williams' cultural materialism, is that they are identical and non-identical uh, at the same time. So everything is grounded in the economy because there's a production of something yeah, and reproduction, production and reproduction. However, social uh, systems and social realms also have their specific specificities uh, and uh, their relative uh, autonomy. Marx talks about ideology and fetishism, commodity fetishism on the one hand, political fetishism such as nationalism, which is quite uh, uh, topical today because of new rising nationalisms. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, for example, when he introduces the idea of the analysis of authoritarianism, uh, what that he calls Bonapartism, he connects it uh, to the idea uh, of uh, nationalism. Uh, Marx was a critical journalist and a critical public intellectual, yeah? uh, so maybe he's a kind of role model uh, for all of us uh, who are uh, active in the, uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the intellectual realm. Uh, he stresses the importance of social struggles. So I think that's Marx's practical humanism. So he argues that only through, through social struggles can we achieve a society that is according uh, to human beings' uh, needs. And he stresses the need for alternatives, how on the one hand alternatives emerge out of capitalism, uh, but at the same time uh, require a big sublation process uh, in order uh, to be turned uh, into something uh, actual uh, and Real. So that's my first part. In my second part, I want to talk a bit about big data capitalism and uh, what this is all uh, about. So that we now talk about big data yeah, and increasing uh, variety of data, velocity uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of data and volume uh, of data is not because of technological development. It stands in a political economic context. On the one hand, neoliberalism could be defined as the commodification of almost everything, including data uh, and communication. In politics, we have seen the emergence of a surveillance industrial complex. Surveillance is also, as Foucault knew, about gathering data uh, and so on. There is a kind of surveillance ideology around that brings forth the culture of control. Uh, so you could say that the collection, storage, control, and analysis of big data stands in an economic and political context. It's all about the control of human beings from an economic uh, side as consumers and as workers. And from the political side, it's about state control uh, of uh, data about uh, citizens uh, in uh, order to uh, be able to better uh, control them. Algorithms so being... calculate, plan, and control human needs and also take over uh, lots of uh, human decision power. Uh, commodification that comes through, uh, is advanced thereby always means some form of social inequality. Uh, the internet becomes a realm of exploitation uh, and uh, class. It entails new forms of discrimination, of rational discrimination, or what Oscar Gendi calls uh, uh, cumulative disadvantages. Uh, there are new forms of digital divides involved uh, in uh, big data. Uh, and also there's the idea that big data and algorithms pose a technological fix to political and social uh, problems, uh, which is uh, one-dimensional uh, logic, and there's categorical suspicion. Yeah? So the liberal idea of that you are innocent until proven guilty is reversed, and you're considered a terrorist and a criminal until it's proven uh, that you're uh, innocent. Yeah? Already in the early 1980s, the Austrian, the forgotten Austrian philosopher Günther Anders, uh, who is the Austrian Adorno, uh, wrote about surveillance that as the surveillance devices uh, become used routinely, the main premise of totalitarianism is already created uh, and with it totalitarianism uh, itself. I'll skip a bit of that. Uh, also what in terms of uh, analysis and research of uh, big data, a new kind of digital positivism uh, is emerging. Uh, the idea uh, that uh, big data is uh, a new form of computational social science uh, uh, where, uh, where uh, the, the data 
uh, is collected and automatically uh, anal uh, analyzed. It is an obsession with quantification. Yeah? Uh, so we could say with Pollock and Adorno that the danger of big data analytics and computational social science is the convergence of social scientific methods towards those of the natural sciences. Uh, and this is a child of a society that reifies people. In terms of natural engineering sciences, it's computer science that seems to colonize everything, that seems to, when we talk about digital humanities and so on, computer science seems to colonize the social sciences uh, and humanities. So there is the danger that such colonization uh, mean, results in a death of critical theory, in, in a death of qualitative and theory-oriented uh, oriented, uh, research, so that in the end, being a social scientist uh, or a scholar in the humanities then just means learning to program and uh, becoming a computer scientist. And I think that's something uh, that should be uh, resisted because the world is more than just quantification. Yeah? The world is qualitative, it's dialectical, uh, it's, or it's to a certain extent based on non-instrumental uh, actions and through uh, through quantitative big data analytics, you cannot grasp the full meaning uh, of the world. Uh, I next want to talk a bit about digital labor and its contradictions. So Google and Facebook are the two world's largest advertising agencies. They are not communications corporations. Yeah? So uh, Google last year had profits of about 20 million, Facebook of about 10 million, and uh, what they do uh, is that they crowdsource uh, value uh, creation. Uh, they are, these are figures for the global advertising revenues and how they have been developing. You can see there's a growth, uh, actually, uh, and the share of online advertising uh, in total uh, global advertising revenues is increasing. And it's because of a duopoly of Facebook and Google uh, in uh, online advertising. So together they control about 60 to 70 percent uh, of these uh, online uh, advertising uh, revenues. However, how does this work? How do they make profits? That's the classical uh, Marxian uh, capital accumulation cycle as he introduces it in Capital Volume 2, where uh, money uh, buys commodities, labor power and means of production, then a new commodity is produced, it's sold, uh, and uh, a profit is made, and there's some reinvestment. In big data capitalism, as we know it in Google and Facebook, this is different. It becomes more complex, actually. So uh, there is a production process and a, a first uh, a first uh, product, the platform. The platform, however, is not a commodity. We don't pay for using Facebook uh, and Google. So it's a kind of gift. It's a free lunch. So the commodity must be something different. There's a second product, the commodity, uh, which is the data that we uh, produce and upload. Yeah? The big data, uh, the content that we, uh, up, uh, the, uh, that we upload. And this idea of digital labor, how it originated, uh, is that uh, people were arguing, or are still arguing, uh, that as users of these platforms, uh, we uh, engage in labor. It does not feel like labor. It's shadow labor, but it creates value uh, and big data that is sold as a uh, commodity. So it, and it's also the idea that uh, uh, I mean that whenever we use Facebook, that we are and uh, Google and so on, that we are performing labor. Then yeah? it means that labor is changing. That value creation then is uh, economic value creation, uh, not just has to do with. Uh, with, with wage labor, but there are unwaged forms uh, of labor, and, face, and there's a long history of it, uh, and Facebook use, social media use, uh, is uh, one of it. Of course, Marx spoke in Capital Volume 1, Chapter 16, he introduced this idea of the collective worker and was arguing that with uh, technological uh, development uh, and the development of, of forms of cooperation, uh, uh, value production uh, becomes more collective. Yeah? So it's a collective worker that produces uh, value. Or he also speaks uh, of uh, an aggregate worker. So we need an extended concept of productive labor, uh, a new labor theory of value, where it's not just wage labor, but also unwaged labor that produces uh, value. And I think in terms of big data capitalism, it would then be a digital labor theory of value. However, it can ground itself uh, on other forms uh, of non-orthodox uh, forms uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, analysis. So in autonomous 
theory, like Negri and others, talked about the introduction of the social worker, yeah? a new working class uh, that uh, creates an uh, interconnection between productive labor and the labor of reproduction. Kylie this morning uh, talked about uh, socialist feminism, where since the 1970s it was stressed that also domestic and reproductive labor, that is it's also mainly non-waged, uh, is also a form of productive uh, labor that uh, uh, cr creates part of the value. And Taylor Smythe's audience labor uh, theory has st stressed in, in the analysis of advertising funded uh, broadcasting that audiences work create attention that is sold as a commodity to advertising clients. And the, I mean, these, all three approaches were created independently in the 1970s, but together resulted in a shift uh, towards the stress uh, on the value-creating capacities uh, of non-wage labor within capitalism. Now, on social media, uh, there is also uh, this type of unwaged productive labor. However, it's changing somehow. Uh, what are features here is that uh, there is presumption Human uh, users produce also social relations. There's constant surveillance in real time. Uh, there's targeted and personalized advertisement. Predictive algorithms uh, are used. Uh, the prices of the advertisements uh, are also uh, determined by algorithms. Uh, so uh, Facebook and Google, in the end, uh, are large advertising agencies that make use of all of these uh, features. However, uh, Digital labor should probably be understood in a more general sense, not just as the use of Facebook, uh, but uh, it can be uh, generalized as different forms uh, of labor, all having to do with the generation of a digital product. It starts with conflict minerals, so there are slaves working in different mines in the world that mine the minerals under slave-like conditions out of which computers, mobile phones, uh, and other hardware is produced. There are Fox, uh, assemblers at Foxconn in China, I think Jack, Joe will talk about uh, this more uh, tomorrow, that assemble uh, the components uh, of these devices. Then there are different forms of software engineering, like at Google, but also highly exploited Indian software engineers. There's the unpaid user labor. And then there's platform labor that uses the platforms for some form uh, of, uh, of, for example, uh, freelancing, online freelancing, crowdsourced labor, and so on. So fairly complex form, and they are all connected together in a kind of international, I call it the international division uh, of digital uh, labor. So these forms of, uh, of exploitation of digital labor don't exist separately. It's all the, the same kind of global companies that require uh, 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 it, and partly they have physical products, yeah? partly they are like minerals and so on, partly it's components, it's also very physical technologies, and partly uh, it's then informational content that is being uh, produced. Uh, in this recent article, I tried to make some calculations about how much reproductive labor there is. Yeah? Uh, and I found data for the US, you could probably repeat it for other kinds uh, of uh, of, uh, of countries. Yeah? So in the United States, the average reproductive labor time, so that's non-wage uh, work that uh, reproduces labor power, is 40, about 44.5 hours uh, per week per person. Yeah? Uh, the average annual hours of wage labor, what one person works in wage labor, is about 1,800 hours. Uh, the total annual wage La uh, labor hours are more than 230 billion, so that's all people working uh, in wage work. Uh, and the rate of surplus value traditionally is calculated as the, uh, the amount of unpaid labor time divided by the amount of paid labor time. Yeah? So if you only take wage labor as the foundation, then it's around 0.9, yeah? which means that the surplus value generated roughly is equal uh, to the uh, to the waged uh, labor uh, time. However, I think what we must also see that uh, I mean, capital's aim is to exploit as much labor as possible and to valorize it. Yeah? And it also exploits unpaid labor and tries to turn waged labor into uh, into unwaged uh, uh, labor and activities that are not labor at all into uh, low-paid or unpaid uh, uh, forms of labor so, uh, in order to maximize profit. So the ideal world, world of capital is a world where profits are maximized by paying no wages at all. Yeah? Zero wages would mean maximum 
profit. So because there's resistance, that's not possible, but it would be the ideal, only possible when in a, in a slave-like fascist uh, uh, society. But uh, what I call the organic composition of labor is a corrected rate of surplus value, where, uh, in, uh, where you have the wage labor's unpaid labor time, plus, and that's now important, also unwaged labor's unpaid labor time, divided by all paid labor time. Yeah? So the rate of surplus value is changed uh, by, adi uh, by, by, by adding uh, on, uh, also the, uh, the, the uh, unpaid labor time uh, of unwaged uh, labor. When you do this, uh, then, I mean, there are there are uh, data for how much uh, reproductive labor time there is uh, in the US, a total of about 580 billion hours uh, per year, quite a high number. That's higher than the total annual uh, amount uh, of waged hours, which is 232 billion hours. And when you then calculate this organic composition of labor, yeah, the corrected rate of surplus value, it's about 5.8, which means that per waged hour, one hour of uh, waged work, there are about 5.8 hours of unpaid work, yeah? uh, reproductive labor time, which is quite, uh, a, uh, quite uh, a lot. Uh, if you then boil this down to reproduct activities within reproductive labor, I mean, on average, there are about 44.5 hours of reproductive labor per person per week in the US. Uh, out of this, around five hours per week are watching advertisements using commercial social media platforms is about 12 hours, so that's around 17 hours. So together, the use of commercial media accounts for almost 40% uh, of, uh, the, of reproductive uh, labor, which also indicates a kind of existence of a kind of communicative capitalism. Uh, reproductive labor is gendered, so in the US, women tend to conduct on average 60% of reproductive labor, men 40%. Uh, if you look at Facebook, I mean, I would say that's a, a form of, uh, of, uh, of uh, it's part of reproductive uh, uh, labor. Then the Facebook algorithm itself is also sexist and racist. So I did some, uh, exp made some experiments yeah, with targeted ads. And it's interesting that there seems to be the assumption in it uh, that when you are a man, you are considered a more valuable consumer uh, when ads are considered to you. So targeting men uh, is more expensive than targeting women. Targeting people uh, in developed countries is more expensive than targeting uh, people uh, in developing uh, countries uh, and the global uh, south. And this, some statistics uh, show this. So there are like ideological assumptions built into these uh, algorithms. Uh, I think I will give an example uh, of I mean, it sounds all very negative. I think there's a contradiction between the digital commons on the one hand and digital capital on the other hand. And all of you who are academics are familiar with open access publishing. How open access publishing emerged is through a critique of the high profit rates of traditional publishing houses who are among the companies with the highest profit rates in the world. Reed Elsevier is one of them. 2016, they had a profit rate of 40%. Springer is another one with a profit rate of 55%. That's very high. Yeah? Probably an average profit rate is not, uh, in the whole economy, is probably not higher than 3 to 5%. 40 or 50 uh, percent. How do they make money? They sell subscription bundles to articles and journals, to libraries, uh, primarily uh, university libraries, and also they sell uh, the content to, uh, to, uh, indiv to individuals. However, universities and academia are to a significant degree publicly funded, uh, and academic knowledge is also a commons. A commons that, as Marx says, is brought about by the cooperation of many people uh, living now, but also with the cooperation by people who lived uh, earlier on. So what monopoly capital does is it privatizes and commodifies the academic commons. And there's a counter-reaction, creative commons uh, and open access uh, publishing uh, and the open access movement has uh, emerged. I'm editing uh, or co-editing such a journal myself, the journal Communication, Capitalism and Critique, which is a non-profit journal. Yeah? However, uh, the, the majority of these kind of open access projects are non-profit. They don't want to make money, really. They are like communities of academics, uh, engaged uh, people, librarians partly, uh, publishing workers, uh, and so on. However, there's also a minority of commodified for-profit open access. They charge very high uh, uh, 
charge, make very high charges for, uh, for not for the content and the access, but for the article and uh, book processing charges, normally paid for by the authors, which just shifts around the inequality, which means when you are at Oxford or Cambridge, they are very rich universities, the university will pay the processing charge for you. Yeah? When you are in, the, uh, in a developing country, very poor universities, you cannot get published. So now it's not, the, the, but everything that is published under this way is as a gift, as a free lunch, online, and you can access it. However, there are new inequalities uh, emerging uh, here. So I think these charges, it's a bit like you go into a restaurant, yeah? you come in, yeah? and then uh, the uh, waiter comes and says, oh, we have been waiting for you already. The kitchen is ready. Please go into the kitchen, cook your own meal. Yeah? And then you cook your own meal, you eat it, and then uh, you, uh, you pay for it. Yeah? So why should you pay for, uh, for, your, for, for your own uh, meal in a restaurant? You could just cook it. Uh, at home, yeah? which would mean that actually the restaurant, the company, it's just an unnecessary middleman, which just also means the, the corporate publishers in open access pub pub publishing are also, some, also somehow become uh, unnecessary uh, middlemen. Yeah? And so there's people talk about uh, green and gold open access. I would like to talk about diamond open access, which means uh, autonomous projects of not-for-profit, non-commercial uh, publishing uh, that do not allow uh, the commercial and for-profit use uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, knowledge. However, there are different political positions on open access. The policy and industry perspective is, uh, so that's the capitalist interest, open access is great, we can make money with it. The traditional trade union perspective is open access is bad. It will destroy jobs of publishing workers yeah, because now it's academics taking over these, uh, these uh, positions. The radical open access pers perspective is that non-profit open access is an autonomous sphere that struggles against capital yeah, and that tries to destroy uh, corporate publish publishing. Yeah. So it's a kind of class struggle in academic uh, publishing. And there's a good example within the left uh, of a conflict arising about open access. Uh, the Marx Engels Collected Works, this was in 2014. They are published in English by Lawrence and Wishart, a communist publishing house, 50 volumes. There is an in a great internet project that some of you maybe know, the Marx, uh, Marxist Internet Archive, who digitized lots of texts and put it online. However, the copyright of some of these collected works uh, is by Lawrence and Wishart, and in 2014, a co conflict emerged where Lawrence and Wishart was saying uh, uh, the, the Marxist Internet Archive should take down some of these texts, like 10 volumes. Yeah? They were saying, well, they, uh, for us as a publisher, it's not possible to survive because there's the Internet and the stuff uh, is for free there. Uh, and, uh, and they said uh, one should not expect cultural content. Do I have to stop? Five minutes. Five minutes, all right. Uh, to, to be delivered for free. The Marxist Internet Archive, uh, on the other hand, uh, says that, uh, that uh, d d d d d Marx and Engels' works are part of the history of the workers' movement, and they should be free. Yeah? So it's a kind of contradiction that comes from uh, the, I would say, uh, from the uh, antagonism between productive forces and relations of production applied to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the internet uh, and uh, to the uh, whole uh, on, online uh, realm. Uh, and I think it does not make sense that like a left-wing internet project and a left-wing publisher have like a, a conflict, they threaten each other, you know, legal action uh, and so on. It would be more helpful that they try to work together and try to find uh, ways that uh, such uh, communist uh, works can be put online, yeah? uh, can be spread as far as possible, but it's still possible to uh, get enough money to pay for the publishing workers. So models like donation uh, models uh, and so on, different forms of, of licenses and so on could be uh, developed. I will skip over this whole thing why the crisis exists. I want to talk a bit about uh, ideology uh, today. Yeah? And I, so I think there are rising nationalisms yeah, uh, everywhere all over the world, and that's also expressed partly uh, online. So I think there is a new, I think capitalism is turning from neoliberal capitalism into right-wing authoritarian capitalism. Authoritarian ideology consists of at least four elements, authoritarian leadership, nationalism, the friend enemy scheme, patriarchy, uh, and uh, militarism. And I want to show you one brief example of uh, someone who knows how right-wing authoritarianism works very well, Donald Trump. The working worker built the foundation for the country we love and have today. But the American worker is getting crushed. 
mega trade deals like NAFTA and TPP, such high and inexcusable taxes and fees on small businesses that employ so many good people. This Labor Day, let's honor our American workers, the men and women who proudly keep America working. They are the absolute best anywhere in the world. There's nobody like them. I'm ready to make America work again and to make America great again. That's what we're going to do on November 8th. So it's Donald Trump talking about the American working class. I think what he does here is uh, he speaks of a mythic collective of the Americans. Yeah? Uh, he presents a unified national interest of capital and labor. So for in, his, in Trump's world, there's not a class conflict. For him, there's a conflict between nations. Yeah? So he presents the, 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 all conflicts always uh, as a competition between uh, between nations. Yeah? He says, where social problems come from, oh, it has to do with uh, the Mexicans and the Chinese economy uh, and so on. He never talks about the fact that transnational corporations both exploit uh, American workers and non-American uh, workers. So for him, there's a unity of American capital and American uh, 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 labor. He speaks just of a conflict of nations instead of class conflict. And as the example shows, uh, he, uh, he also uses Twitter, social media yeah, as a, a communication tool uh, for uh, spreading uh, nationalism. Now I come to my conclusion. I think the crisis started in 2008. It turned into a, 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 a political crisis where both the left has been strengthened and also the right. I, however, think that the far right has been much more strengthened. Yeah? So it's movements. Uh, like this, yeah? for example, the UK Independence Party in this uh, cunt, uh, country. Yeah? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not optimistic about how the future will look like. Yeah? So Rosa Luxemburg uh, was uh, saying, I mean, she was writing at the, uh, at the eve of World War I, she was then saying that in this hour of highest political crisis, socialism is the only salvation for humanity. Yeah? And I think, I want to ask the question, are we at the eve of World War III, how will society, uh, this development uh, really uh, continue? That's a picture I draw uh, about uh, Tony's books that he writes together uh, with Michael Hart. They describe a kind of contradiction between the empire and multitude that results uh, in the commonwealth. Yeah? Uh, and I think uh, this contradiction between empire and multitude has resulted in a world situation now where the future is open. I mean, we're in a kind of bifurcation uh, in a complex trajectory where the future, it's unclear how it will continue. I think there are several options. There could be a new world war. This would be nuclear. It would be nuclear extinction of humanity. That's the worst option, really, yeah, that could ha happen. Uh, what we already are uh, experiencing is austerity measures, hyper-neoliberalism, yeah, uh, partly authoritarian capitalism, there could be a new fascism uh, at some point uh, of time, yeah? uh, or we could see maybe uh, as an alternative, yeah, and that's the things that should give us hope and what we should struggle for, uh, a democratic socialism uh, or a new form uh, of uh, communism. Uh, and then if you look at the, the, at the left, there's a division of, an unfortunate division of labor in the left. Uh, green movements struggle for protecting the natural commons. New left-wing movements and parties struggle for protecting the social commons. Tech movements struggle for protecting the communication commons. However, what they have in common is that they struggle for the protection and strengthening of the commons and not for its privatization. Yeah? Uh, so I think in this situation of danger, what we need is a convergence of the left, just like capital is converging, we need political uh, convergence, yeah? a party for the commons, movements for the uh, commons, a social democracy 2.0 that is socialist democracy and democratic socialism at the same time. In terms of uh, communications, this could mean uh, a kind of alternative, that we should strengthen the alternative digital uh, commons, platform cooperativism, public service internet, uh, and uh, so on. So the question is, is a, a second communism, a democratic communism, uh, is it possible? And what could be the role of academics uh, and all of us in this situation that we are now uh, in? 
Franz Neumann is a forgotten critical theorist, part of the Frankfurt School, uh, and he, in the early 1950s, uh, was describing uh, in the McCarthy era uh, a situation that was uh, politically quite dangerous in the US, and he was asking, what can we do? What can we intellectuals do? Yeah? We could say, what can we organic intellectuals today do? Yeah? Uh, or we, we knowledge workers, what can we do? And he was saying, what we can do in this situation of crisis is a dual on, on offensive on anxiety and for liberty. Uh, we can engage in education and in politics. Politics should be two things, yeah? the penetration of the subject matter of our disciplines and fields where we are active with the problems of politics. We should take position on political questions. Yeah? If we are serious about the humanization of politics, if we prevent, wish to prevent demagogues from using uh, psychological and ideological anxiety and apathy, then we must not be silent. We must speak and write. Well, probably I would add we must speak and write uh, in a socialist way, uh, in a communist uh, way, in order uh, to challenge the capitalist world system. Thank you. I'll stop here.